I'm just going to briefly, uh, let me take five minutes maybe, read some um, brief statements about belonging that, that um, uh, seem important to me. Uh, and if you want me to reread them, I'll reread them. And then the rest of it is, is questions, comments, discussion. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, I, for, first I want to say that, uh, as we all know, we are social animals. We, most of us are, um, and maybe not all of us completely, but basically human beings are social animals. And we need to belong. We need to belong to, we need to belong with, with some exceptions perhaps. Um, and in my view, there's no substitute uh, for, I mean, we belong to and with our creative projects, uh, careers and professions that we love, uh, any activities that we love. And at the same time, I think there is no substitute for belonging to and with persons. And by persons, I, I, I mean primarily of our own species, but I don't mean that exclusively. Um, uh, pets and, and other creatures that we become close to are persons. And, and anybody who's had a pet knows that, they, that they are persons. Um, so, there, so that's the preface. There's no substitute for belonging to and with uh, persons. Having said that, I believe that we are in uh, a multi-layered and vast complex of whatever. Uh, so uh, I, I think it has certain characteristics that if you want me to talk about it later, I will. But uh, let me just start my, my list here. Um, we all and each one of us already belong to a whole, the nature of which we cannot circumscribe, fathom, or adequately think or fully feel. Next, we belong to ourselves, of which there are more than one within each of us. Alternative centers of consciousness, which desire, will, joy, sorrow, and long to be recognized, and when possible, not always possible, included in our consciousness and our expressed personalities. I am excited that there is very much more to me than I thought. Next, we belong to all entities that are, at whatever level of self-awareness, persons. That includes all individuals and the species of which they are, have been, will be, expressions of our specifically primate lineage. I am mostly, mostly proud to be a primate. We belong to the entire enterprise of life, its ferocity, its determined survival and creativity, its benevolence, and in my view, its final transcendence of nature, including human nature. I am, again, for the most part, proud to be a part of life's enterprise. We belong to this cosmos, its light and its shadow, and the light and the shadow, capital L, capital S, behind, beneath, above it, which manifests it from some inconceivable supercosmic reality. I am awed and struck with wonder by the limitlessness of what I am a part of. Next, we belong to and are already 
within all levels, planes, and dimensions of being whatsoever. I am stunned by the magnitude of what I am. All of this means that we, that we belong to this mystery, which unconditionally and remorselessly eludes us when we try to grasp it. But nonetheless, ultimately and immediately enfolds us, is us, of which we ourselves are embodiments. I am exhilarated by the mystery of you, of me, and of all that is. At the same time, and as a part of this mystery, there are places and entities at all of these and whatever other levels and dimensions of our being us there may be, which it is best for us to not belong, to which we need to refuse belongingness. In my view, there is only one to which these places and entities belong. We are not equipped to belong to these dark places and their inhabitants and survive as us. And we should utterly refuse their claims, their claims that we belong to them. For now and for present purposes, we belong here, aware that we belong to each other. And in this moment, right now, Okay, so want to hear it again? We put on music, read tarot, comments, questions. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll launch us off maybe a little bit. So I just remember, uh, I don't know, it was a warrior weekend or something that somebody came in, you know, and said, spirit is everywhere. Like you know, how how can you argue that? So so much of what you of what you laid out for us there, the mystery of the universe, it's like indisputable, almost unknowable. You know, yes, we belong to all this. We obviously do, and there's no denying it. Um, and yet, then in so then if we but then if we break it, so it's an and, and then we break it down to a day to day, our feeling of this circle together. It seems that the uh, the concept of belonging is a fluid process. Can Sometimes my consciousness Michael, lets Michael, me understand eyes. that I am in connection. Sometimes my perspective moves me out of that um, perspective. So very, very fluid. And it is through my own prism of understanding mm -hmm. of whether oh. I feel connected or yeah. not. And then I'll say one other thing, just to throw in the mix, because I was having this conversation with somebody the other day that, uh, again, the sort of sense of tribe, that we are tribal. It's built into the human psyche. Mm -hmm. So we have this innate to, to be with those who we perceive are like us. We have an affinity. Mm -hmm. And that it is sort of a modern concept to be able to think outside that, to embrace others who are seemingly different than us. It almost, almost seems to go against the primal psychic understanding of our comfort level with those we perceive. So the idea of diversity is, is it, we have to be at a higher conscious level to be able to embrace that idea. And I'll stop there. No, that, that, those are various um, universes you just opened up, as you know. <laughs> <laughs> a lot, a lot, a lot there. Uh, where the rubber hits the road, uh, in terms of personal psychology, in my view, uh, as I said, there is no substitute for the closeness with others, other humans. Um, although there are people that, you know, fall outside that, that general um, uh, view or have feelings that extend uh, belongingness in other ways and maybe even anti 
human to some extent. Uh, but um, in, it, I, I, it's been my life experience that the human being is at, at multiple layers of reality. Reality with a capital R. Most of which, as you, as you say, Michael, we're not aware of. Um, you know, to, to survive and to flourish uh, in, in, as us, as we normally think of ourselves, and in this reality as we normally perceive it, we have to be focused on and through the ego and maybe and some accompanying uh, altered states. Um, that's how we stay here, you know, and make something. Uh, so, you know, I'm not, I'm a mystic, I would say, but, but I'm not the kind of mystic that believes the world is a, an illusion or pointless or meaningless, or we should escape it entirely. I believe we are us here now to live it, to, to experience it. Um, so I, I think that um, uh, some of the things I just mentioned are not either or things. Either we're here or we're elsewhere in a more abstract space of Think, you know, for example, feeling like we're part of the enterprise of life. On the other hand, uh, being a, a, it's not so abstract. Uh, being able to connect up with uh, life as a whole, for example, actually, uh, my experience of it is, is that it can be em enormously empowering. Uh, of me as an individual, humbling, and in humbling, empowering. Uh, and there was, you said so many things. I'm trying to remember. Um, uh, well, that's it for now. Well, I only said so many things because you said so many things. Yeah, I know. I know. It's great. <laughs> it's great. I just couldn't keep, keep track of them. But yeah, I think we are multi dimensional beings. And um, how you know our our usual sense of who we are is valuable and oh I, you're the tribal thing I was going to say yeah, it thing. seems clear to me that uh, and from anthropological and archaeological evidence and so forth maybe even genetic evidence well certainly that now that we um, are evolved for small group living. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, as you pointed out, uh, when we seek to expand our who we include mm -hmm. uh, it, it is it runs counter to the evolutionary push uh, to what we evolved to 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 experience easily so it does take some effort and imagination and open-heartedness and uh and so forth to expand beyond the tribe um mm -hmm. so yeah but that expansion i'm suggesting to the extent that it can be done um uh adds to and enriches yeah that was the word i was going to use yeah, yeah our mm -hmm. personal lives and our tribal lives too mm -hmm. yeah so, so doug in your class about the uh, the chimpanzees and other species i noticed you mentioned where you're proud to be a primate and Mostly. so many of, and so many of my conversations with people i I bring up the fact about uh, that we're true and who we come from and what we come from, and no wonder we act this way. Right. This is this is what we were born into, and whatever changes we make uh, are because of our frontal cortex and are trying very hard to be able to be more than 
but so we've got that disposition to be all those other things that these I'm not going. I'm going to say lower than not in a negative sense, right? But that these different primates that we that we inherited from them. Yeah, we are not zebra. We don't behave in social groups like zebra. We don't behave like octopi. We behave specifically. If if you look at primate ethology and any kind of depth all that's good about us and all that's not so good about us is right there uh, in our fellow primates. I mean, in all of them really, but the closest is, is the chimpanzee societies. Uh, I'm not saying we're limited to being, uh, you know, uh, exotic or, or special cases of, of primatism. But, but it is true, we are primates. And so there are limits on what we can express personally uh, and how we can express socially. Um, bye, Andy. I saw your, yep, okay. So, uh, but, but you know, we're also, um, this is, primates are, a, are the highest, expression of the enterprise that is life on this planet that we know of for sure um david i see your hand i'm gonna i'll be right there um the enterprise and by enterprise i mean life itself is uh enormously aggressive um and in, in, in some sense, intentional. Um, we would, from our perspective, it would seem to be un, uh, unconsciously intentional, but it is, I mean, um, it aggressively pursues environments. It aggressively seeks different forms of energy to use, whatever it can get a hold of, wherever it finds itself. And so it, it, life, I'm being a little metaphorical here, maybe, or anthropomorphic, but, but it looks to me like in 4.5 billion years of the evolution of life, it keeps, it exploits all environments that it possibly can for its sake, for its thriving. And so it wants energy and it gets it, and it wants information. As you look at the evolutionary thing unfold, you see life uh, acquiring. Each time it's almost reaches extinction, either through its own greediness, and we can't go into the details today, but or through some god awful environmental catastrophe, like the eruption of the Siberian traps and volcanism and, and Siberia and so forth. Life acquires in each of those catastrophes more information and it adjusts itself. Now, there's no question that it's being, um, that genetic mutation is taking place in ways that life apparently uh, would seem to be passive in those situations. But I think, um, that's that's looking at the tree in the forest. Life isn't passive. It, it is certainly in an interchange relationship or mutual relationship with, with its environment. And looking at the forest rather than the trees looks to me like uh, life is on an enterprise. And we are uh, particularly fascinating and awful and terrible and wonderful expression of what all of life is. Sorry, David. No, no, I, um, that's great. I, I've been, I do a lot of reading and, and watching of evolutionary psychology. I came across something that was interesting. It said that um, for the first several hundred thousand years, uh, we were human, we were prey. Mm. Back to Australo, Astra, Australo, Australopithecus, yeah, right, right. I mean, and even early, early hominid, we were prey, 
Yeah. And so, so we've, we, we formed prey groups, which is we we formed groups. We looked out for each other. We gave warnings. We learned to cooperate because that's what prey animals do. You know, predators don't have to do that. Prey do that. And then eventually we became hunters and now we're the, we're the dragons of the earth. We're the apex predators. But, but part of the interesting, our genius is we've retained that, that substrate, that structure of being prey. And we remember mm. Mm. And, and it's our ability to cooperate as prey species do that mm. has made us produce a predator. And That's interesting. Yeah, you know, predator, not all predators, many predators also have sophisticated societies yeah. Yeah. Uh, that uh, are organized around cooperative uh, predation. So wolves, uh, wolves, for example. Yeah, wolves, for example. But, but others too. Um, uh, who was uh, uh, William? Were you? Uh, yeah. Yes. I I didn't have my hand up, but. Uh, oh, I thought you did. Oh, no, sorry. but I'm you know I'm filled with a lot of excitement from what I'm hearing, and uh, I'm sure I could come up with something to say. Absolutely. Okay, you can have three minutes to think about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I will say this. Um, I was thinking about my belonging to my son who just passed away in January oh. from half his life spent as a drug addict and half in that same half of his life spent struggling with type one diabetes mm. and some severe injuries that, that coincided with his diagnosis and the start of his addiction and in, in introduction into into pain pills and he died a miserable miserable death oh. uh, on a cold concrete sidewalk a few blocks from my house oh. uh, back in january and um i celebrated his life uh, on martin luther king day along with you know with my friend george durani who celebrated the life of his father on that same day it was it just coincided wow and I've been thinking about my belonging with him in that disconnect that I had for so many years that I couldn't fulfill that that sort of manly, earthly need that I have, you know, encrusted in my heart to want to my offspring and my my lineage to to succeed. And and then he just sort of dis disappears like a puff of dust. And I'm like, wow, that was a long, long, long piece of work, and I don't even know what it means yet but it just seems so poignant and then I, I look back at my own life and i feel this connection with the primordial it is a you know a, a seven eight year old boy and my only question is really is where does this all end mm, mm. you know where does the end and then somebody tries to explain it and i said well where does the end end and that yeah. was my next question uh, oh no where does the uh, end end and then uh it was <laughs> Sarah and I were talking about my granddaughters yesterday. We're sending off little cards. They were born a year and a few weeks apart. And so I always celebrate their birthdays on this at the same time. And I assigned them both uh, a galaxy that mm. described their characteristics to plant ah. these questions and seeds in their, in their minds. So the, the uh, older one is the Andromeda galaxy and the younger one is the pinwheel galaxy. Ah, ah, <laughs> ah. Yeah. Okay, hang on. I gotta X this out. Okay, bye bye. Well, um, I am so sorry about your son uh, and your your unfulfilled relationship with him. Right? It's uh, and the. In addition to your question, I have a question because we, we have a daughter who's 25, my wife and I, and um, who is going through a very dark time as a young adult and uh, alien to us now in many respects and having a very hard time connecting meaningfully um, I, I, and uh, this is just all over the place. Um, uh, 
children that is part of, unfortunately, part of a lot of parents' experiences. I'm going to say, uh, and this is me, I'm not imposing this on anyone, but I'm going to say that before I get to my question, that again, the I know it may be cliched, but I do think there is no way around uh, what I think is the truth that we do live in mystery. And I don't mean mystery that we can ever uh, solve or resolve. I mean, the real thing is beyond us. I do believe that it has a benevolent purpose. And I also believe that, again, it's just me, that life, probably nothing's life, but certainly not human life, I don't think ends with biological death. I mean, I've had, and we can't go into that, but I've had experiences that I wouldn't have believed if it came from somebody else telling me that have convinced me of that. So whatever role your son was playing, uh, whatever role he was assigned to play, and you, uh, see, I think we are living, but we're also being lived. And, and I do believe there is a happy ending. My question is, and I, I believe me, I have read all the a proposed answers to this question that in every religion, every spirituality, every everything. And I said, well, okay, yeah, that seems somewhat true. That seems somewhat true. But it, it, in the end, it's not um, um, satisfying. My question is, why do some people have to go, maybe lots of people, have to have their experience here in this life so dark and so painful and so and others don't uh, and i'm not talking about you know material um comfort i'm not even talking about health per se i mean life my life experience has been magical miraculous joyous not all of it, of course, but, you know, but why? And um, why do some of us have to go through, and I'm thinking of my daughter here too, why do some of us have to go, you know, a dark road? I don't know, but I do believe all roads lead to Rome and uh, it is a happy ending. Yes. Uh, Holly, Holly, I know that's not satisfying, but uh, Holly, what you were going to, and then somebody else. I'll come in after everyone's spoken on this discussion. I was going to change topics. So just keep going. Keep going here with this. Okay. Yeah, I have something. Somebody, somebody had a hand up. I, I did. Oh, okay. So um, I just want to comment um, about um, belonging and um, instinctually, we are animals. Um, and then you get into the concept of judgment um, and what's socially and politically correct. But as far as being judgmental, I think that every time you go into a situation, you judge to see if you're safe as an animal. Mm -hmm. And from what I've studied and what I've gained through Taoist longevity practices, that the each one of the plates in our head has a vibration that goes to a different universe. Mm -hmm. um, 
And in those dimensions, you perceive and see different things. And through Qigong, as you open up your orifices, you perceive the world differently mm -hmm. and gives you the centering to be able to not spin when the world is spinning because that is the chaos of the universe that we create. Now, as far as the darkness that you were alluding to, I'm 35 years sober. I lost a sister to fentanyl in Baltimore, Maryland. I've been in and out of situations, 12 stepping people. And I believe that our lessons in life are lessons that we need to overcome to um, transcend the nine heart pains and the nine heart palaces. Mm. And relationships is one of the most important. Health is the first. Relationships, prosperity, creativity through your children. Um, there's a lot of dimensions there. And I myself struggle with basically every one of them. Mm -hmm. but that is my lesson. I believe in Taoism and who I study with that we chose our parents as, mm -hmm. as a spirit. We chose who we came through for the lessons that we needed to learn in this lifetime. So, and I mean, beyond, right? And in beyond. Lifetime and beyond. Um, I, I was going to say, uh, William, I forget if you're William or Bill. Will. Yeah. Or Will. Okay. Yeah. Oh, I know you are Will. I'm, I wanted yeah. to come back to William. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no, including you, but. Um, Bill's fine. You're Bill? Bill, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, the belonging part. I believe that you belong to your son and your son belongs to you even now always was, is now, will be. Um, and as Will was saying, some, some version of that, there is continuance, there is uh, re-presentation of us in other, um, venues, let's say, or whatever. But I do believe it's all meaningful and purposeful and that nothing is wasted or lost. And, and the belonging finally is total. That, whether that can be right, uh, and I would say it can't be fully realized in our fleeting, you know, 20 years, 70 years, 90 years, it can't. The quest for wholeness, for example, that is very much a part of the Jungian framework that I come out of uh, in terms of psychology, the quest for wholeness is uh, essential, vital uh, to our be learning some of the lessons, well, that you're talking about. Um, and of course, I think not just in terms of King, Warrior, Magician, Lover, but other uh, uh, categories too. None of us, though, obviously, at least obvious to me, reaches wholeness, wholeness in one lifetime. There's just not enough time or energy or opportunity. But um, we can get a taste of wholeness uh, through spiritual exercises, through, through work with the psyche. Uh, so we know it's there. And, and in that sense, it's the most important thing to us as individuals is to become more human in, the, in a deep sense or more human. And I think that means becoming more humane. Um, 
but the task is left unfinished at biological death. So, I mean, at that point you say, well, I say, well, okay, what a trip. Or I say, well, that didn't mean anything, uh, my life, because I, 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 I missed potentials, I missed opportunities, I didn't. Or I say, this is part of an ongoing, an ongoing, and you ask, where's the end? I, there are ends, I think, whether in this life or beyond, there are ends at which we know we belong. And then there's the call to move toward another end. And then there's the call to move. So, and we, we belong to the whole, the whole thing. We belong to it. And actually there's no escape from it. From Doug? Yeah. Doug, I have a, something I'd like you to address. Um, Bye. So I felt that if I belong to more groups, the more expansive I am. And in yesterday's workshop, Paul Johnson pointed out that if you belong to a group, there's an exclusionary part of that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so it's like, well, if I belong, then I'm also excluding. So can you speak to the yin yang of yeah. belonging to this, figuring out I belong to a new group? And then what's the ramifications or how does the exclusionary part play into that? Yeah, uh, I think you're absolutely right um, that uh, belonging to a group automatically has some, if not a lot, of, of exclusionary dynamics to it, or you couldn't be a cohesive group. Um, mm -hmm. I think it is, um, um, it's a genuine problem that you're raising. I do think there's such a thing though, as belonging to a group that is, it's a balancing act. And in a way we're talking about boundary issues. <coughs> belonging to a group that, uh, how do I say this? That excludes and doesn't at the same time. In other words, that accepts uh, the humanness, the, the validity, the, the correctness in some respects, and, and so on and so on and so on, the value of um, those who are outside of the group without losing group cohesion. Uh, one thing that happens with groups is that as they tighten up and close their boundaries, uh, they become hard, brittle, jaded, cynical, angry, whatever. On the other hand, groups that don't manage, in other words, they build rigid um, boundaries. There are groups, however, that are, are not respectful of bound, their own boundaries and, and would like to include everyone and maybe everything. And those groups, I'm afraid, dissolve into a fine mist. Uh, they just kind of evaporate eventually or lose direction or cohesion and, and so forth. So I think what you're raising, I don't have an answer, I, except to say that I think that's, that's part of our dilemma as individuals, as groups, as a species, as civilizations, as races, as genders, as everything specific that we are is to, to celebrate that and be that in a way that is as little exclusive as possible. I don't know. Yeah, um, what I'm hearing, I believe, is tolerance. Um, so 
if you're talking about gay, straight, Muslim, Catholic, it's like I'm in, I belong to one group, but I'm not making the other group wrong or the right. enemy or uh, <laughs> just dismissing them. Excuse me. Yeah, it, and I think it's more than tolerance. I think it's more energetic and active than that. I, but I agree with you. Um, I would say there's a way to celebrate being who we are as individuals and as groups, and at the same time, celebrating others while we're still making value judgments. I mean, there's, <laughs> that's the other thing. There, there is no way to avoid making uh, value judgments, um, but they can be gentle value judgments or, or um, uh, preliminary or never, you know, never um, solidified value, fully solidified value judgments. I do want to talk about uh, dark stuff uh, in a bit, but uh, Susan, is it Susan? Um, Sarah, actually. Oh, Sarah, Sarah. Yeah. No, Sarah. no, 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 no worries. Um, I, I was a former stutterer, so this is like a little anxiety speaking up, so I'll try to be as articulate as I can. Um, Will brought up a really interesting um, point, and I've heard this many times before, that we choose our own parents. Mm. And I find that very fascinating because I remember my first thoughts, I remember like two, three, that who are these people? I got hence uh. the four Enneagram <laughs> status. Who are, these, who's this, who are these aliens? I don't belong here. Uh, but it's only like maybe two or three years out from the womb. So if I chose my parents, it was like kind of a quick thing there. Like, what did I do? So I don't even quite uh, understand that whole premise. Yeah. So that's, uh, yeah. Elaborate uh, on, someone can elaborate on that. Um, 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 someone said, I can't remember who it was, someone said to my wife Olga and I when we were agonizing about our daughter recently, they said, yeah, you know, she was alien. <laughs> you could see signs of it from early on yeah. to, to your values, to your you know, worldview, to your, <clears throat> so, um, but they said, and that caused friction, uh, but they said, Imagine what it would have been like for her, the daughter, though, if she had not been born to you, if she'd been born to someone else. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and that's like, I, I, I would be open to the possibility that we do choose our parents. Um, I'm, I'm not going to chart, you know, chisel it in stone because I, I don't chisel anything in stone. I, I really, I have uh, intuitions and provisional beliefs and so forth, but um, but I, I, you know, there is something to wonder about that. Um, um, and in some cases, of course, kids who are born to really parents who maybe shouldn't have been parents uh, or, or, sh or shouldn't have stayed with each other, at least let's say that, uh, come out brilliantly. Uh, and at other times, you know, wonderful parents, uh, and nobody's perfect, but wonderful parents. And the kid is like, what? Um, I'll tell you what I'm going to do pretty soon is I'm going to take all my developmental psychology books out to the backyard, put them in a fire pit and burn them. No, I, there, there is that. There's, there's this mystery, again, of how certain temperaments get delivered to or show up in, you know, families with quite different temperaments. Yeah. I mean, there's the whole genetic thing and all that, and, but, but I think there's a lot more to it than that. I think there is mm -hmm. resonance, and I think we are, and this is another way of belonging i think we we do belong to each other even when there's tension and friction uh and when we feel alienated we still belong to each other i mean we, we uh, okay so i believe in the happy ending so i think that 
Um, it's all for a, a benevolent purpose, ultimately. I would like I to say yeah. that I, I think belonging, be, belonging begins very, very early in life. Um, mm -hmm. Attachment begins, yeah. if not preconception, certainly during a time in utero. The bonding occurs then. Yeah. The fetus hears every sound and feels every emotion that the parent has. Remember. And the people who, who come up in a uh, secure birth environment, a secure womb environment, and have a healthy birth are able to, to become attached not only to their caregivers, but also to the environment in which they are. They learn how to connect and I think they have a much greater sense of belonging than most of the people in our Western society who were raised using European uh, child rearing practices that leave us very poorly attached and with a longing to belong, but that longing may never be satisfied. Mm. And a lot of our behavioral issues of addiction and overeating uh, and mental health issues come from a fundamental lack of bonding, attachment, and connection. So I don't know where your daughter fits into that. I would uh, expect that she had a fairly good early life, but uh, we're different from each other. And I think a lot of it is built in very early into our lives. So I yeah, just wanted I, to throw- No, I, 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 and I agree with that. It, it's another uh, conundrum because, um, um, and, all due respect, I am going to take my developmental psycho psychology books outside and burn them uh, because, uh, you know, there is truth there, uh, loving parents, nurturing environment, etc. Uh, and yet it doesn't explain, uh, to me it doesn't fully, uh, the strange kind of belonging that happens in families where essentially everything is right, good, good enough, in Winnicott's phrase, uh, and yet the kid goes off into, I mean, where are you going? Uh, what are, you know, so it's part, I, I, everybody's heard of Rupert Sheldrake, right? The, uh, the rogue biologist, uh, I think he has a little more truth going for him than the more orthodox uh, biologists and psychologists would suggest. And that he talks about morphic resonance that we are, and I would say in utero too, we are in within uh, psychic or psychological or spiritual or whatever resonances. <clears throat> and he talks as Darwin did actually too, about reversion to the wild type, you know, that, that there are individuals born that uh, it's like, where did they come from? Uh, well, they do match up sometimes, and I'm talking not so much form, morphic in that sense, but uh, psychologically or psychically, they resonate more with a, a grand grandparents or great grandparents or a distant whatever, and maybe even, you know, individuals that go back thousands, maybe a couple of million years. Uh, in other words, I do think there's a lot going on with every soul, with every psyche, uh, much of which we cannot account for. <clears throat> So you talked about the word mystery. Uh, I've gotten to the place, uh, as I've gotten, gotten to the age I am now, 87, about seeing about how my, what's happening to some of my friends and what's happened to me in my life in spite of taking care of myself so well, is that a lot of it is just a crapshoot. Um, it's just we do and we do and we do and how much control do I really have? And how much control do I not have? So it's, I, for me, it's a, as much as possible accepting the things that I can't control 
and still leading my life as well as I possibly can in spite of the circumstances. Now, Dolores does not like my older son. They had some problem years ago. And I said, I am not willing to give, I would not have my older son as my friend. And I am not willing to give him up as my son mm. just because there's so many things about him that I don't like that are different from how I want I want him to be and how I want our relationship to be. But what is is what is. I'm not willing to give that up. And my yeah. younger son is totally different from him yeah. and I have a totally different relationship. How the hell did that happen? I don't know. I, I, I'm just, I, yeah. just feel, I just feel blessed about that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, um, you raise another, of course, one of those perennial uh, questions. Uh, let's see, I'm looking at a chat here in a sec, sorry. Your children are not your children, they are. Ah, okay. Can I address that in a moment? Who was that that just did that chat? Oh, Kent, okay. Um, another one of the, the problems, uh, issues, struggles that we have as human beings, I think, and it's all about belonging, is um, uh, you talk about control or not. I think we are in partnership with whatever, okay, the environment forces, I believe ultimately the divine, I'm not imposing that on anybody, but we're in a creative or destructive, at least in this lifetime, partnership. The partner in this does respond, uh, does reflect to our proposals, to our the way we are and what we're trying to do, and and we do have some at least, you know, in a pragmatic sort of way at that level, some control. We never have anything like complete control. It is a partnership, and our partner or partners. Uh, in that co-creative enterprise, uh, it's not an equal partnership. They, that, has much more vision, uh, power, uh, et cetera, than we do. And so, yeah, I mean, the uh, ancient Egyptian proverb uh, that, the human being proposes, but God disposes. Uh, not meant to be fatalistic, but to remind us that our partnership with the enterprise of life and all that is, um, is uh, not an equal one. Um, Kent, you had something in that. I see another chat came up. Well, I wanted to just share that quote from Gibran, you may want to read it, but it certainly reflects a lot of what you said earlier on, as well as uh, as what I was saying. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. You yeah. want to read it? There's so many aspects here. Have we got another like 12 hours? You can go another. We can go another 15 minutes or so. <laughs> I think I think it's 12 lifetimes, Doug. Not 12. Hours. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Well, in 12 hours, maybe, maybe we could skim the surface, but uh, <laughs> it's at least one lifetime. Uh, there were somebody else had a, a couple of people. Yeah, so, had a new, so had a new subject. Yeah, so Kent, Kent put in, and I think it's worth reading out loud, especially for the recording quote from Gibran Your children are not your children, they are the sons and daughters of life's longing for itself. Yeah, they, they come yeah. through you, but not from you. Mm -hmm. And though they are with you, yet they belong not to you. Mm. Oh right. <laughs> wow. Can I tell you a short, a very short story about uh, when I was, uh, uh, that illustrates that. A different kind of belonging to my mother, okay? Uh, years ago, I, I won't give you the whole background, my, but my mother and I clashed a lot as I was growing up. And uh, she was, from my perspective, always seeking power over me. 
And um, of course I had to rebel to become an individual and to become a man. Um, and um, uh, so we argued a lot. I came home, uh, drove home from college. One, I think it was my senior year or something. And we got into a, an argument as usual. And I, I've been working on mother issues as, as well as, it wasn't college, no. No, it was way after that. I was probably late 20s, early 30s, working on doing depth psychology, being psychologized and so forth and working on men's issues and my absent father and so on, but also working on mother issues, a much neglected topic. Wow. Um, anyway, so I'm home, we're arguing and I, I meant to say, God almighty mother. Instead, I said, God all mother mighty. <laughs> wow. <laughs> and there was this stunned silence on both of our parts. We both realized what, what that was an admission of. And in that moment, I realized that Gibran thing mm -hmm. that um, my mother isn't my mother. She's certainly not the goddess. Um, she's my sister. In other words, the generations are just, a, and it's more than this, I don't mean to oversimplify, but the ge generational relationship is a, a means of bringing us into this reality. But the truth is, we are all siblings of the God all mother, all mother, um, or how, however you want to picture it, but we're, we're on an equal level, actually. We're all brothers and sisters. And I don't mean that in a Pollyanna way. I really mean that. We are all children of that. Yeah. yeah. Christopher. Yeah, I when when I entered kindergarten, I entered kindergarten late because my parents were traveling and I was assigned to a buddy um to take me through my first week of kindergarten and uh he's still my best friend today. Oh wow. <laughs> but um one of the ways that I thought about parenting is this this buddy, right? The the parents here first and they're now the child's now entering it's like all right here let me take you with me show you the ropes that kind of a thing um i want i want to bounce back to to some of what kent was saying and, and i want to i want to talk a little bit about uh, i think there's there like my own wound stuff with my parents i've been one of the things that's been really helpful for me is realizing like the inevitability of the wound mm -hmm. That, that I'm going to have a parent wound. And if my parents do everything perfectly, then the fact that they didn't wound me becomes the wound itself. Yeah, right. <laughs> because yeah. the wound becomes like the path uh, to growth and individuation and, and, and healing and things like that. I, I think there's, I, I do a lot of work with the Enneagram and, and I, I focus on, on the Enneagram as like shadow work and, and dealing with wounding and things like that. And a lot of times when I tell someone when I'm first teaching someone about the Enneagram and, I, and I'm talking about the three wounds in the Enneagram, um, they'll think about their children and they'll be, oh no, I did, I must have done something terrible to my ch child. If they have, if they're this Enneagram type, then that means they have this wound. I'm like, hey, there's no type of the Enneagram that doesn't have a wound. Yeah. Right. Like right. this, they're get, they were going to have some wound, right? Like it right. doesn't mean that you were some terrible parent that this happened. Um, oh. Sorry. I, I, I think a lot of what Kent was saying about it, like attachment styles and things like that were, was really good and is a piece of the puzzle in trying to figure out, right? I think your, your piece around like, we don't get to control our children is, is super important. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might even actually segue into what you were, you were wanting to talk about around the darkness, right? That there, there are traps for us out there, <clears throat> even, if, even if we're, we're fine and perhaps even, especially if we were fine. Mm -hmm. then we, we might be more naive 
around a trap. And I'm, I'm really curious to hear more about the stuff that belongs ultimately in the universe, but doesn't belong with us yet. And, and your thoughts around that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, fantastic uh, point. I mean, I, I mean uh, there is no way to become a finite entity without wounding. There's no way to enter the world without being wounded some way or another, because this is a place that uh, in which there's fragmentation. Uh, uh, the fragmentation is good in my view, in the sense that, uh, um, that it is, it is only by becoming individual beings that we can meet you know, uh, non-being cannot meet. Uh, and and the, the meeting is, is for me, that's, that's the whole core and the whole point of it, of any of it. Um, to, to switch to the darkness, which we are talking about, because um, this is, as C.S. Lewis said, quoting somebody, and I can't remember who, um, this is the Shadowlands. There's light, there's dark. It's unavoidable. It is what it is. It is what we are, um, at least as animals, as nature. Um, speaking practically uh, and, and reverting to a Jungian kind of frame here, uh, uh, there are, I believe, at all, maybe not all, but many levels of reality. Um, dark spaces and, and i'm not i don't mean dark as uh, as the beauty of darkness there is that but i mean uh, awful places destructive of personhood places and i believe i think i'm crazy maybe that's okay but i believe that there are at least as many and probably many more spirits which are not or psychic centers, whatever, that are not incarnated in the same way that we are at this moment, that inhabit both spaces of light and dark. Say it's all within the psyche, okay, that's okay. Um, uh, but, you know, in Jungian thought, we're, we are encouraged to uh, become conscious of and integrate as much of our personal shadows as possible because uh, with the understanding that the the personal aspects of the shadow are wanting to contribute to our lives and they do have valuable things to contribute okay and that's part of becoming whole but a distinction is made between the personal shadow and the collective shadow uh, and, and I would say beyond the collective shadow, maybe it's the same thing, the cosmic or super cosmic shadow. Uh, so stuff, if we're in an active or even beyond that uh, analytical process, stuff that seems dark, destructive, painful, et cetera, uh, but which may be carrying some of our strengths, uh, you, can, you can feel when that is actually part of you that's been alienated and needs to be re-included, uh, the per, uh, personal shadow. But beneath, if you try to go deeper uh, and get into collective shadow, uh, as Jung warned, that is so dark, it is so vast that there is no finite person that can integrate that. Um, and what's in there uh, uh, are further psyches. It's not just an abstract sort of dark thing, though it may be that too, but it includes, um, <clears throat> in my life experience anyway, entities who do not wish, they do wish to express themselves, but they do not care about our wholeness or our survival, our integrity. 
that's really dark stuff. And they may claim that we belong to them or that they belong to us. That claim has to be rejected. And there are dark places where we should not go because we will not come out the other end. Yeah. So that, that's boundary stuff at a deep level. Mm. Um, I, I think, you know, again, uh, the struggle, and I'm over, I'm sorry to oversimplify. Again, we need, an, let's do another 12 hours because um, the, I don't mean to say in a dualistic kind of simplistic way, non-Sufi way, that there is a, a struggle between light and darkness or good and evil in a simple way, but there is. And you know that when you, you come up against what the hair stand up on the back of your neck, you know you're in the presence of evil. Mm -hmm. um, without necessarily being moralistic about it, there is something that intends us no good. And those that we love or the species, good. Those places we need to stay out of. Uh, and if you're working with a good analyst or a good spirit guide of some kind, they they will know. They will have, and you'll feel it when you're getting into uh, deep water, and you need to turn back from that. Jung said, you know, the, I'm paraphrasing, but the personal shadow needs to be integrated. The collective shadow needs to be exorcised. Mm. Mm. Yeah, I'm struck from some of the stuff you were saying at the beginning, talk really looking at, I think you were referencing the great chain of being, mm -hmm. right? And, and there's a, there's an element of really recognizing that and really getting the, the, the humility piece, right? Of there are some things I can do by myself. There are some things I can do with like one-on-one -on -one support. There might even be things, right? Like I would, I, I think Martin Luther King Jr., was working on collective shadow with thousands of other people, right? And and there are some things that it's just not the time to attack back yet. Forever. Um, yeah. Um, <sighs> perhaps, I don't know, right? Like, um, but certainly not right now. Yeah. Certainly, certainly, um, yeah, it's not time to meet yet. It's not time to integrate. Um, there are other things to integrate first. There's growth that needs to happen if it's ever going to happen. Yeah. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I, I would add to that again, this is me not trying to impose it, but stimulus for thinking uh, that uh, the struggle between goodness and evil and that we live through and as uh, does not get resolved for most of us in this life. So if it, first of all, it can't because it's a reflection in my view of, of a much deeper and vaster struggle that's going on that we have little or no awareness, direct awareness of, thank God. But, um, Secondly, because there simply isn't enough time. There isn't enough time. Uh, and so uh, to try to, in our present state, we can't do it. Yeah. You know, but as you said, Christopher, maybe there's a state of consciousness and being in which it can be engaged. I don't think it's going to happen for me in my lifetime. <laughs> but but I, there is something going on that is, uh, and sanity, um, admittedly a fluid concept, sanity can only be gained to the extent that it can be gained through a, again, a balancing act of integration 
of what can be integrated without destruction of the person and what must be avoided. Uh, so, so there are things that we should not belong to or, or accept their claims that we belong to them. Uh, and, uh, and not be romantic about thinking that, oh, well, yes, I, I am the all. Well, that's probably true, but not this Sunday morning for me right now. And if I had to face the all right now directly, I'd vanish. I mean, forget about cutting the grass that I have to do this afternoon. <laughs> Speaking of not enough time, our next session starts in 10 minutes. Uh, and I think it'd probably be good to take a break. Um, is this, does this feel like a good place to complete? It's okay for me. Okay, cool. Thank you so much, Doug. Uh, and thank you, everybody, Christopher for inviting me and thank you everybody uh it was a pleasure meeting you it really was and and christopher you're going to put up the contact information then right yeah um let me so so you want to say a little bit about the class that you're about to teach just, just real fast yeah if, yeah if anybody's interested uh <clears throat> in in an eight week every thursday morning 10 to 12 class in the decay and collapse of the roman republic I'm teaching that through the uh, emeritus program uh, at Oakton Community College um, in Skokie, Illinois, S-K-O-K-I-E. And that is, uh, you just go online. The class is online. It's Zoom. Yeah. Uh, and so Oakton Community College, Skokie, Illinois. Then I think the, it's the uh, the uh, continuing education, and then uh, from that emeritus. Yeah, I actually found the course and I put it in the in the link, and and when I post the video, I'll also post the link to oh, it. Okay, all right, great. Anyway, it would be fun to see you there. Yeah, and it was it was great. Uh, it was great for me. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so yeah, this was so wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Doug.